Hello and welcome from Medellin, Colombia, to this episode of Crossing Borders with Nathan Lustig, where I have conversations with entrepreneurs doing business across borders and the people who support them, with a focus on those with some connection to Latin America. This episode is brought to you by LatemList.com. If you like this podcast, you'll enjoy LatemList's daily tech news reporting. Sign up for the mailing list and get weekly email updates. My guest today is Mike Packer, a partner at QED Investments, a U.S.-based venture capital firm that's been investing in Latin America since 2014, building one of the most impressive portfolios in the region, including companies like Nubank, Creditas, Credit Justo, Guia Bolso, Loft, Quinto Andar, and more. We talk about Mike's career path from banking at Capital One to joining QED as a principal and moving up to partner, how startups should think about raising money from venture capitalists, and Latin America fintech. We also cover the story of how QED became a first mover as a U.S. fund investing in the region, some of the most interesting portfolio companies they've invested in, and where Mike sees the region going in the future. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Mike Packer from QED. Hey, Mike, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being willing to do it. Thanks for having me. Very excited to be here. No, of course. So where are you in the world today? I'm actually in Tampa, Florida, which is where I live. Um, it was a, one of the rarer days of being in my home office. It's not, not that rare, but spend some time in my home office between my travels, uh, both to the QED Center of Gravity in Washington, D.C., but also uh, of late in Latin America. Awesome. And tell me a little bit more about QED. What do you guys do and what do you invest in? So QED is a early stage venture capital fund. Uh, we've been around for about 11 years at this point and made uh, over 100 investments in that time. We today are almost exclusively involved in looking at fintech as an opportunity. And that is uh, a bit of a global view that we have, although we're concentrated in the U.S., UK uh, and LATAM. Uh, but we focus on fintech because a lot of us are former operators in financial services and uh, fintechs. And what we are looking to do is bring some of those experiences to entrepreneurs and help build the, the next, next, uh, next stage of companies. And we typically get involved in the Series A stage of a company, although we've got a ton of flexibility around that, uh, given the way that we're structured. And uh, our kind of thing that we, we, we really spend a lot of time focusing on is finding projects and entrepreneurs that we want to be very active and involved with, where we think we can be helpful and where the team thinks we can be helpful as well. So a lot of investors will say kind of platitudes, yeah, we like to help. We look for companies that we can get involved in. But you guys actually do, from what I've heard from other founders that uh, you guys have invested in. What are, what are some of the things that you do to help founders actually succeed and help companies grow? I think it's a great question and something that, that we, um, you know, we talk about a lot internally uh, as we think about expanding our team and expanding our ambitions and making sure we're living up to, to that value proposition to entrepreneurs. You know, some of the things that we, we do um, are very specific in terms of uh, a project or a new product that, that uh, a company may be working on where we've had uh, specific experiences in the past. Uh, I personally have helped uh, build you know, first generations of uh, risk models and credit policies for customers in the lending space. Uh, we've had partners who go in and build sales organizations from scratch. Uh, and then we do a lot more, um, you know, probably more typical things uh, in terms of spending a lot of time on, on strategy, uh, governance, board advisory, uh, those, those, you know, recruiting a lot of the things that uh, most investors do. But the things I think that differentiate us are the ability to get really deep into the details, uh, in, in, and again, specifically in the financial services space because of our, our prior experiences. Your QED was founded by um, a group of executives from Capital One, including Nigel Morris, who was one of the co-founders of, of Capital One. And that experience building that company uh, is something that uh, we think is extremely relevant uh, in, in this world. And so um, those are the type of things that we try to bring, bring to entrepreneurs and to, uh, to early stage companies. Yeah, the operating and, and experience is super important. Uh, we're going to jump, go into QED a little bit more in the future here, uh, maybe in about five minutes or so. But I want to jump into you and learn a little bit more about uh, about your story. So where are you from originally? So I, uh, 
I was actually born in the Washington D.C. area in the U.S. Uh, very early, uh, grew, uh, my family moved to to Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, my my uh, dad moved with a, a job. He was uh, in, in sales at the time, and so uh, so we uh, we quickly became Southerners uh, in, in the uh, in the U.S. And that's that's where I grew up and went to high school, uh, and then I went uh, to school, uh, excuse me, to college uh, in Virginia, the University of Virginia, and uh, ended up in in Washington D.C. for about a dozen years and, and recently uh, moved my way to Florida, uh, which is where uh, my wife is from. And, and we have some, some family here as our, as our family was expanding, trying to uh, optimize a bit for that side of our life. Congrats on the uh, recent national title with Virginia. That was, uh, that was really good. Yes. Yeah. That will be a, uh, well, at least for us, we're a little biased as Virginia fans, but we think it's a pretty uh, crazy story and um, a lot of improbable events happening along the way. Uh, so I, I'm sure there'll be a movie on it at some point, but I actually, I actually ended up in Minneapolis for the, for the championship game. And it was an amazing experience. Yeah, no, we were, we were rooting for Virginia once Wisconsin was out because, uh, Tony Bennett and his dad are from, uh, right. from Wisconsin. So we have that Wisconsin connection as well. Well, if, if Tony Bennett ends up listening to this, this podcast, he, it sounds like he knows he has two fans. Uh, in our- <laughs> he does. He does. And what did you, what did you study in undergrad? So I studied engineering. <clears throat> I was kind of a uh, drawn to math and science as a as a um, you know in my early early years, and didn't really know what engineering was, but ended up as an engineering major. Uh, I studied uh, systems engineering, which I always kind of joke is is the fake engineering engineering. And, and what we ended up <laughs> spending time doing was a lot around, and this was you know in the early two thousands, a lot around using data uh, to make to to make decisions and, and make, um, you know, different processes work more efficiently. And so I was drawn to, uh, you know, big, big data sets as this kind of trend was coming, coming along, which is ends up how I ended up in my, my job, which I know you'll ask me about next. But so I spent a lot of time, um, you know, build, building models, uh, thinking about uh, process engineering, uh, and those types of things. And then uh, somewhere in there, in my, my four years at school, I, I, picked up uh, economics as a bit of a passion as well. And I ended up getting a double major in economics. I had this kind of combination of uh, systems engineering, very database thinking and and economics, uh, which kind of reflecting now, I guess, however many years, 12, 13 years on, uh, has has been very, very practical in a lot of the ways that that I still think in the ways that I I view the world as well. When you're going through your last couple of years of school or just, just graduating, did you know what you wanted to do next? Did you know you wanted to get into the finance world, or was it something that just sort of came up when you're looking for a job? I had no clue. I, I you know, I, I spent uh, a lot of my time in in college, uh, you know, more more on uh, the I guess the social social side, and uh, you know, not thinking, it, you know, in the later years starting to think a little bit more, but not thinking deeply about what I really wanted to be, which I think was a, both a, a good thing and a bad thing. Um, but, but when I started to think about it, I ended up kind of in this bucket of, yeah, let, let me go see what being a consultant is. A lot of people who had my similar background had gone on to, to work for big consulting firms, uh, and kind of, you know, d- doing that type of work, uh, was something that I ended up kind of trying to lean into as I figured out what my career was be. I think finance was kind of there because my friends, some of my friends were doing that. Uh, but it was never a very explicit decision, um, in terms of where what you know what what I was going to go go and do, um, you know, eventually I ended up at, at Capital One, which their kind of strategy of hiring uh, out of out of undergrad, at least at the time, I think still today, is to kind of go after that um, you know consultant type analytic background and then put them into a business slash finance setting. So what you know that really uh, ended up uh, getting me over the over the hump in terms of wanting to make a leap in, into that type of job. What were some of the things that you did when you were at Capital One? Yeah, so I started as a as an analyst, uh, and my first couple of years there were similar to some of the things I had seen in my my engineering uh, work. So translating data into information, into models, into the strategy. Of course, on a bigger scale. I mean, I showed up to to Capital One. I think one of my first jobs, they gave me a, a data set with a million rows, and I was like, "This is a lot of rows." <laughs> Uh, now, now, of course, it seems seems small, but at that t- at that time, Capital One was one of the largest data and information companies in the world. This was as Google and Facebook are, are kind of just getting getting started and you know pre cloud and all this. And um, and so you know, I spent a lot of time 
trying to figure out how to translate that raw data in the credit card space into um, you know business models. And I, I did things like how do you uh, model uh, demand and supply to determine the pricing? Uh, how do you figure out you know who to market at what time and how much to spend? And then of course uh, a lot of a lot of work in risk, uh, knowing kind of what you know about about customers. You know, the data that, that goes into the automated underwriting machine of, of Capital One, I spent a lot of time on those things. Um, so that was kind of my, my early base of really getting into the details of how data was used and then kind of starting to more put together the bigger picture of how you, you, you actually make the decisions once you have the tools to do that. What were some of the biggest lessons learned that you had from your time working at Capital One that you now apply in your VC career or with startups? So I had several. I mean, I ended up spending about 10 years at Capital One and, and you know, three or four kind of very distinct uh, roles. I mean, but I think the, the major ones for me um, in terms of that I use today, I think first and foremost, the power of, of data and information. Uh, Capital One it was and, and remains an organization that's very, if not, if not best in class, close to best in class in the way that they use, use data and information and creatively and always looking for new ways and really spending time uh, and, and therefore money on, on the kind of analytic exercise of truth seeking. So that that's kind of the first first thing is you know where data can tell you uh, the the story. Let let data uh, let data help. The second was really around disciplined decision making. Uh, so you know Capital One is an organization that, that gives gives credit. Uh, credit can be a a, a dangerous uh, thing when things go bad. And I I had the uh, you know, during my time there, we went through the, the Great Recession in 2008, 2009, and seeing the power of some of the, the way the company used uh, resiliency and uncertainty and decision making and staying true to that, even when times are, are good and when times are bad, uh, I think was something that, that it will always stay with me. Um, you know, I think it may, maybe I had a little bit more risk aversion coming out of that than I need in my current, uh, current job, but, uh, but I've been able to kind of work around that. And I think the third thing, um, which I learned as I got more into kind of management and executive roles and you know, roles dealing with outside partners and, and um, you know, where you're connecting a whole bunch of things. It's just the importance of, of culture. Uh, you know, I, I was involved in uh, several kind of really good initiatives and teams where everything was, was churning together and working really well. I was involved in a few things that, that didn't go uh, as well. And when I kind of reflect on some of the core reasons why I think they didn't go well is because of kind of misalignment on, on culture, whether it's between you know, to internal like organizations or external organizations. And so, you know, I, it's something when I look at companies today and, and try to uh, help, um, you know, CEOs or, or kind of executives at, at our companies, you know, trying to stay true to whatever the culture of the company is, is something that, that uh, made a huge impact on me. So you mentioned going from being more risk averse to much less risk averse in uh, the new role as a VC. How did that come about and how did you decide to get into venture capital? Yeah, so I think uh, risk aversion is in the, the eye of the beholder, and um, you know I think the game that we're we're in now involves taking a lot of risk because you're dealing with an early stage company, you're managing um, kind of a pool of of uh, assets or a portfolio of companies, and trying to to kind of make it make it uh, look like something that's great in in the end, and, and that requires a lot of risk taking. It's that's why venture capital uh, exists, and you know, I think I, I went from a world where Data told most of the story uh, to data now tells some of the story. And so my, my risk aversion is, uh, or, or risk taking, let's just say that's probably a better way to think about it because I think a lot of people may look at me and say I'm really risky. Uh, but uh, my risk taking is less, uh, less tied to data. It's still very tied to data. And when I look at new companies, I'm looking for those early signs of, of something taking off. I'm looking at Kind of how the business model can be validated or not with with the traction and what the company's done, uh, but then I have to supplement that with, uh, okay, what who who who's involved here? How's what's the team? What's my opinion of the the entrepreneur? Where we think this market's going? You know what else is going around it? And so all of those things I think are are, are, are where I try to take risk as opposed to the, the place where data data can can help. Um, so I, I didn't get to your second question, but uh, that, that, that's kind of maybe a longer version of the risk, the risk, the risk question. Well, when you first got there and you're switching from one culture of having to be a little more risk averse to changing the way you think about risk, what were some of the biggest 
either culture shocks or biggest changes that in mentality that you had to have coming from the more kind of traditional banking world into venture capital? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest one, well, maybe, maybe there's two. Like the biggest one for me was kind of and continues to be the uh, energy and passion and excitement around starting your own company or starting a company, right? I, I'm, I get, I have a, I sit in a very privileged position when I, when I work with entrepreneurs, but, but seeing kind of that build momentum uh, and that be a huge part of how a company becomes successful. Uh, I think it was something I had, I had no, no real clue about. Um, and look, I'm only, I'm only three plus, I'm three and a half years into this thing. So I still, I, I could still argue that I have no clue about it. But I think that's my, actually tied to my other, other lesson that I've learned is that venture capital, there's a whole bunch of, you know, sophisticated things that we can do, but it, it tends to be more, um, maybe not more, more but a good part uh, art uh, over science. And, and there's a whole host of the people who have been in this industry for a very long time who, you know, know that they don't know everything. And so I think that was super empowering to me going into this space, knowing that you, know, there, you need to be disciplined and you need to kind of learn uh, and it's a long cycle. So again, still in the middle of this, but, but there's not a right answer. And so finding your own way was, was super new to me and also uh, very empowering uh, and still is as I try to figure out, you know, where, how do I fit in to this world of, of venture capital? So thinking about fitting in, uh, in venture capital, you started as a principal and now you're a partner. And I think that's one of the things that entrepreneurs maybe don't understand the inner workings of VC firms very well. And some people will say, hey, you should only go talk to a partner or others will say, start with the principal, make the relationship, then move up to the partner level. Can you talk about how that those mechanics work generally in VC or maybe in, in QED and your advice to founders for if they're trying to go and talk to uh, a venture capital firm to try to raise money? Yeah. So at QED, we're, we're a very partner heavy, heavy firm. And we, because of our, our strategy of wanting to be, um, you know, experts in certain areas and to be hands-on, we tend to have a slightly more senior uh, team on, on average. Uh, and I think within QED, if you're, if you're talking to anybody within, within QED, you're, you're, you know, you're in a good, you're in a good spot. Um, you know, of course, there's a bit of uh, a bit of hierarchy to to our firm as there is in any, but the kind of entry points come from all directions, and we've seen them come from you know bottom to top and top top to bottom. So in QED, what we're trying to do is create um, kind of a flat uh, starting starting funnel, and we do a lot of work um, you know between internal we call them teams, but internal teams uh, at QED to try to see where there are overlaps and things that we're we're looking you know in certain areas areas of focus. And I think my broad advice and things that I've seen at other VCs is it, it just, it, it varies. It depends. I think in, uh, you know, there's uh, almost always, you know, you could make an argument that talking to somebody who's, who's more senior or closer to writing the checks is better. Uh, but I think, you know, w trying to get in with a looser connection to, you know, a partner versus a principal or an associate, I think can some, come sometime kind of set it, set things up the wrong way. And so I think the most important thing is is kind of how you how you get in and how you get started and how you you know, leverage things like warm introductions and that kind of stuff. And um, so I would encourage you know entrepreneurs to do what they know how to do, which is be be scrappy and, and find your way into firms where they think they 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 might have a, a good fit or a good partnership uh, potential with. Because at the end of the day, you know this is uh, this is something where you're you're gonna you're gonna find a partner who's gonna be with you. I and mean, we think we when we make investments, we're gonna be with you for seven to ten years. Um, and you don't want to you don't want to make that that decision lightly. And so, you know, even if a firm may look good on paper or you think it may fit uh, before you've met them, it's much more important, uh, in my opinion, to to start making those relationships early so you can uh, you can figure out who you want to work with uh, as an entrepreneur. So, you know, I think it's get get in where you can in terms of a, a venture capital firm, and then work on on building the the relationships up and. You know, most people who you, you're going to want to work with are, are, are going to be uh, transparent about how things work and, and where things stand. And so seek, seek that, those type of relationships no matter, no matter where they are within the firms. What question or questions should founders always be sure to ask VCs that they're looking to get investment from? That's a great question. I think, you know, a lot of the, what I, what I would say, general advice here I, it holds right. So, you know, what type of investments 
excuse me, what type of investments do you typically make? You know, how do you interact with your portfolio uh, companies uh, over time? Um, and, and what you're trying to trying to figure out is how you fit into the the way they think and the way that they they make decisions, right? If you're if you're seeking a, a two million dollars from a fund that has a minimum, you know, uh, five five million dollar check, you know, you, you those are easy things I think to figure out. You know, the more nuanced things I think depend on on what what you're looking for in a partner. So and they, they hinge more on that second set of questions of how you how do you interact with with companies. Uh, you know what types of what types of uh, companies have uh, you invested in that have been successful that have not, uh, and I think those those types of questions start to get to a little little deeper on you know what what uh, what is involved beyond kind of capital in this relationship, um, and I think at the end of the day, you know when you're when you get to um, kind of really vetting a VC, the references are going to be the most uh, the most most powerful and most telling. Whether it's you know a portfolio that they already have, if they're a very kind of tenured VC, or whether it's kind of professional or personal connections, um, you know, I, I think that has been from you know, a lot of the situations I've viewed. That's been the way that uh, I think uh, a lot of the entrepreneur to entrepreneur conversations um, spark the most kind of insight on on how how funds and firms work. It's hard. It's hard to run away from from that that kind of real data point. Thinking about running away from places, most U.S. <laughs> VCs, U.S.-based VCs, ran away from Latin America until very recently. And they're just just starting to to get into the region, maybe over the last twelve to eighteen months. And there's still a big chunk of U.S. VCs that say, "You know what? I don't even touch Latin America." How did QED decide to make Latin America central to the investment thesis? And what were some of the first uh, steps to to get into the the region? Yeah, uh, so. I th this st this story um, is still kind of being written a bit, but LATAM seems to be gaining a lot of positive momentum. Uh, and I think our you know we've we made our first investment in either late 2014 or early 2015, uh, and it was more more chance than kind of a strategic. You know, we we let's look at LATAM as a region. Um, so I'll I'll tell you about that that evolution, which which uh, which I think is is kind of interesting, but it was almost by accident, honestly. Um, you know, we. Uh, uh, so this is before I was with QED, so I'm using we a, a little liberally, but we knew uh, David Velez uh, before he started New Bank. Uh, Nigel Morris uh, was an advisor at General Atlantic. David was working there. They kept up. Uh, when David was thinking about uh, starting New Bank after he had spent some time at, at Sequoia, uh, it, you know, we were a very natural call and connection for him to, to, to make because of our experience in the, the credit card sector. And a lot of the original vision for that company, and and still remains some some of the vision for that company, it was to take a lot of the success that Capital One saw in the U.S. in the uh, in the '90s and take a model very similar to that to Brazil. And so that conversation uh, was kind of started at, at that kind of that kind of level, uh, and uh, eventually, uh, I, and again, I think we 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 wished in hindsight that, that he would have uh, convinced us probably a little sooner, but eventually. Uh, we started taking a little bit more look at Brazil and what was going on, and agreed at the the broad opportunity. And, and this, you know, uh, one part of the the thesis that we still have today remains. It's pretty simple, which is just you know, Latin, Latin American banks broadly is is a lot of uh, is high high returns, low customer satisfaction, uh, because of the high concentration in the in the industry it seemed fairly ripe for disruption, especially in, in underserved segments. And so we started just digging in on, on that part of uh, the thesis, and we made the, the investment in, in New Bank, uh, which has been uh, amazing to watch. And then uh, very quickly, you know, we were introduced to to a few other companies uh, in in Brazil, uh, and it was more kind of opportunistic, uh, you know, bottoms up as opposed to top down in terms of our our, our strategy initially. Um, you know, if you you fast forward uh, four years, you may you may want me to rewind for some of this story, but you know, fast forward, and now there are. Uh, you know, two and a half of us or so focusing on LATAM full time. Uh, we 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 have fifteen uh, investments in the region. We're in the process on, on number sixteen, uh, and it's now something like a quarter to a third of our our uh, forward forward looking uh, investments. And you know that's uh, that's it's a very exciting exciting place for us right now. And it's kind of uh, again it evolved a, a little bit from opportunistic to now. I think we're trying to be much more thesis driven and what we're going after. And where we're going to see some of the next waves of innovation in fintech. That's super interesting, especially if you look at some of the 
specifically Silicon Valley firms that have just started, if they start to have success like uh, QED had success with Nubank and start to get into the region, maybe you'll see four to five years down the road, uh, the kind of big Silicon Valley firms with portfolios of 15 or 20 companies as well. That would be really big for the region if that continues to, to happen. Yeah, I mean, and I'm getting more and more calls of, you know, our, our friends out uh, on the West Coast starting to look at Mexico, uh, Colombia. I mean, Brazil has kind of always been a conversation, but it's, it's coming back uh, now um, after you know, some of the improvements in the, in the macro. And so, yeah, I think, I think that that is a very possible thing. I mean, one of the things that we struggled with and continue to struggle with, which would, I think will be important for the broader ecosystem to evolve is making sure that it's not just money uh, chasing what, what, you know, might seem like an opportunity from, from, you know, north of, north of the equator, or I guess just north, uh, but, but more kind of nuanced in how, how they understand the longer term opportunities. We, we, you know, not actually I have, uh, we have one partner in Mexico city now, but one of the things that we always talk about is, how do we make sure we stay stay close to to the kind of region and understanding some of the the things that we don't uh, being from from the U.S. and you know, we've relied on a few partnerships and uh, some some uh, you know very very friendly and and open people kind of across the region to to help us um, you know make up for not having boots on the ground so to speak. And I think the ecosystems today and especially when you look at, at fintech are small enough. Where you can you can kind of track them and understand them and see them, uh, and you know we spent we do spend a lot of time on the ground, but again it's not the same as kind of living in Sao Paulo and totally understanding uh, what's going on there, um, and you know same for for the other places that we we invest and look at. So I think that money and interest is is very exciting, the time for the region. Uh, there's a there's a whole bunch of positive things going on, and it seems inevitable whether it happens. Uh, now or or kind of later, and I know you have a, a viewpoint on this as you've seen a couple uh, cycles uh, more than I have, but but I, I do think that interest is is real because you're starting to see some some real things come out. But there's there's still going to be a there's a whole lot of work to do uh, to get the, the ecosystem there, to get the infrastructure there, uh, so that we can really see you know huge outcomes for you know all the money that could potentially come come into the region. For sure, and I I think. Thinking about cycles in LATAM, especially if you look at fintech, this generation of, of fintech, most of them are generating real revenue. Some of them are already profitable or could be profitable if they didn't want to grow grow this fast. It's, it's different from uh, many of things like like Uber where or WeWork where there's just no chance that they're profitable for for a while. Um, so it's it's really interesting to see the sort of fundamentals of the of the ecosystem starting to get built better. That's a, I mean, that's a phenomenal point. I mean, and one of the reasons I think why QED has uh, has done o- okay in terms of finding finding companies and opportunities, you know, that fundamental view of making investments and back a little bit to my personal bias on data and 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 you know proof points. You know, we tend to to favor those types of models generally, right? Because we can see that the model is going to work. On a unit basis, and we spend a ton of time talking about unit economics with with both our, our pipeline, but also our portfolio companies. And you know, I think you're you're spot on where that view forces you to think about, you know, maybe not explicitly, but but at least implicit implicitly about sustainability uh, of of the model and, and of the company. And you know, I'm I'm not I'm not naive enough to 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 know that uh, or to say that you know if if the cap capital markets turned off, that these companies could all all survive today, but you at least give yourself that much more of a chance when you have a business model that, that can work close to out of the gate. And you know those opportunities will be uh, harder to come by as you see more and more uh, investment and more and more entrepreneurs in the region. So I think you know, that's been another reason why we've seen those models not as um, uh, not not as you know not growing fast enough. And, tr- and trust me, they're all growing extremely fast, which continues to. Uh, to surprise my my partners who focus on the U.S. and U.K., uh, but also you know you can you can build a really long, enduring, sustain, sustainable company by starting with fundamentals. So, talking about some of the companies in the portfolio in Latam, what are some of the most interesting ones that uh, <clears throat> you and the firm are working on, and what problems are they solving? Yeah, well, it's I mean it's hard to hard to call out any one or two, um, but. Uh, I think of a couple recent conversations and recent investments that we have going on. I mean, 
you know, new new bank has kind of recently announced the entry into Mexico, uh, which we, or which we think is a very exciting time for that company. Um, you know, it's it's less of a you know quote unquote early stage startup at this point, but they are they are kind of doing very innovative things and helping move the market. And so trying to figure out how ex- their expansion is going to play out, I think is, is something everyone in Latin America, and frankly, probably even globally is, is watching. I think very exciting uh, for, for everybody right now. Um, you know, a lot of our companies are getting to the point where they've done, you know, one or two things pretty well and need to start thinking about the next phase of their company and the kind of continuing, you know, what's the long-term vision for the company. So, um, you know, we're talking with a lot of companies right now about, you know, do you add a product, you know, do you, and again, this is mostly in, in uh, fintech, you know, consumer facing or SMB facing space, you know, do you add a product, you know, do you start moving to something that looks more like a bank? Uh, and so, you know, we're starting to see companies get mature enough with what they're, what they're, Kind of started with that they're getting into this next step, and that's that's a pretty common common thread about, about, around a bunch of companies, um, uh, and so that's been exciting. I think that you know we just recently made an investment in uh, a company in Brazil called Loft, which is kind of taking a version of the iBuyer uh, model to residential real estate in Brazil. We think is very exciting to you know, not only it's some of the trends we've seen worldwide with with companies like. Uh, like Open Door and, and OfferPad, uh, but also taking a very um, emerging market approach to kind of real estate. And you know, when you think about all the things that are broken in uh, in, in the real estate world in, in LATAM, the opportunities I think are kind of endless. So between uh, a few of our investments there, we're, we're seeing a lot of excitement around. Okay, what can this become in you know five five ten years? And I think that's really exciting to see uh, uh, companies thinking big. And, and by the way, that's that's actually been a pretty broad recent trend I've seen, even from talking to companies that aren't in our portfolios, especially with the entrant uh, or the announcement of SoftBank coming into the region, you're seeing entrepreneurs, you know, be, be, think big, talk big, you know, thinking about with a little bit of, which I, honestly, just a little bit of validation of the market being there uh, to say, oh, you know what, I can think bigger. And I think that's a, that's a really exciting place for, for all, all these companies, uh, all these companies to be because, you know, it, it just take. I mean, you you see this, you see this too, right? Sometimes it just takes a little bit of a uh, a switch in terms of, of confidence or validation to to really get the company to the next level. Yeah, I think especially with the new generation of startups between Newbank and Rappi, the 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 founders of those companies are some of the most ambitious people you'll you'll ever meet, and I think that's starting to rub off on more of the Latin American entrepreneurs that maybe before thought, you know what, maybe I'll only do this in my country and the neighboring one, or maybe I'll do it in my city, but I'm, I'm not going to try to go out and, and, and really kind of take over the region or take over the entire country in my, in my uh, business. So I think it's, it's super interesting now that there's more role models for companies that are seeing, you know, Rappi with their billion dollar investment and in new bank getting uh, huge valuations from Tencent and, and other investors uh, across the region. I think it's it's a really interesting time to be in LATAM. Totally agree. Totally agree. I mean, again, that's what it takes to build the ecosystem that's going to be sustainable and, and kind of longer term, right? And the more you can have the top talent in the region thinking like that, and and um, you know, not not working for incumbents and whatever, it's is is great for everybody. I think. I think yeah, looking at uh, the the portfolio that that you guys have put together for for LATAM. One of the big common threads beyond fintech is just unlocking the potential of millions and millions of people. For example, you know, we talked about we talked about Newbank on other other episodes of the podcast, but like credit card interest rates were in the three four hundred percent rates in Brazil before Newbank comes in the market. Uh, you have Creditas and Credit Custo, which are allowing people to um, actually get working capital based on an asset for businesses and for for other loans. Where again they were at a couple hundred percent or a hundred percent interest, and now they're at something much more reasonable. Things that in the U.S. people say, "Well, I don't get it. How is that even possible?" Right. Yep. So you look at the knock-on effects of all of these different businesses. Uh, it seems like it's one of the common threads in in what you guys are doing. Yeah, we we definitely have a soft spot for underserved markets. Uh, having spent time investing in in some similar things in the fintech space, but also spent time at, at Capital One and, and all the time that. Uh, 
or all the kind of energy that that, that company puts around uh, underserved credit in, in the U.S. And so I think it's been a very natural place for us to look because our skill set has been helpful. And I think to your point, it's also a very uh, open space in the financial system because there's not a lot of competition. Uh, there historically hasn't been a, a lot of activity. And so when you can bring the combination of potentially new structures, new technology to get uh, solutions to, to customers um, or, or businesses faster and better, you, you can open up a whole bunch of doors. And, and you know, when we think about those value propositions, we don't think about them just in terms of price. We certainly, you know, the, the APRs, like, like you mentioned, you know, price is a big deal for, for consumers. But just the, the broad, you know, being happy with your financial services uh, is a is a is a low bar, and so we're encouraging these companies and you know all entrepreneurs that we talk to to not only think about um, you know where where can you find the economic opportunity, but but also how do you make sure your customers love your product, uh, and so when you get the convergence of those those two things, uh, a little bit of the bias that we have to to lending and lending ecosystems, I think that's why you've seen uh, our portfolio a lot of a lot of plays in, in the lending space. Um, you know we tend to know it better, and it tends to be at least we think a strategic sweet spot right now in terms of uh, of fintech. Um, so yeah, yeah, and and it it just looking at the portfolio have to give you guys a big congrats for being in basically all the top deals in fintech in the region. It's it's really impressive. Yeah, I mean, thank you. We um, I think again we you know there's a little bit of we were in the right place at the right time. I think we also think you know we're in a pretty uh, good spot. When we think about the, the where the market is and the value that we can add, and I think that that, that our portfolio is a bit of early validation of that, uh, because you know we were one of the one of the first funds to to really be looking at the at the region and the kind of the last last four years, and certainly one of the first who was focusing on on fintech as a, a very kind of niche uh, niche niche vertical, and um, so you know one 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 thing after another, and we ended up with with some of the some of the uh, some of the, the early early leaders uh, in the industry. I think you know right now we're we're trying to take that learning to figure out who's going to be who's going to be next, which is I think expanding our um, our view of of fintech and frankly of the of the region a bit because you know when you look at consumer financial services in Brazil and you know we're still an investor in, in New Bank and uh, we have Credit Pass we have Via Bolso um, you know we have a, a Pay, payroll company Sherpa, uh, it's kind of hard to look at the segment and say, you know, can you make another investment in uh, consumer lending, both from a concentration perspective, but also potential conflict. And so, you know, we're, we're starting to stretch our comfort zone a bit and, and look at other other segments and other other parts of the world. And real estate is one that I kind of alluded to earlier. Um, we've been trying to figure out, you know, where uh, where open banking and, and some of the new banking models uh, are going to go. You know, almost more at the the infrastructure layer uh, as opposed to you know consumer facing layer. I'm st- I, I'm uh, personally uh, obsessed with uh, s- small businesses, SMEs, and, and services and needs of that segment, uh, and it's kind of trying to figure out where the uh, overlap or convergence of of financial services and finance treasury management uh, kind of uh, come in for for SMEs. And I think even more more we're looking at things that that may not look like fintech, but uh, you know, if you if you take the 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 view through the QED goggles, we can make it fintech because it's a proprietary platform. It has deep customer relationships. It's close to either billing, buying uh, things that impact the capital of of, uh, of clients. And uh, you know, you're seeing a lot of companies think about um, you know how do I make uh, you know fintech part of part of my my value proposition. I think a good example of this, of course, not a, not at the QED scale, but Mercado Libre and what they've been able to do. In, uh, in payments and lending uh, in the region is something I think that's that's a lot of other companies are starting to think. Hey, should I be doing something in uh, in payments, or you know, should I be helping my customers more than than uh, the kind of initial value proposition that I've developed? And so we've been we've been more and more excited about that because of how how far we have to go. I think before um, you know specific fintech infrastructure or fintech. Uh, direct companies would would have to go. We, you know, these companies may already have an advantage uh, on the the acquisition of of new clients or new customers because they already have a relationship. If you could go back to when you were first starting with QED, knowing what you know today, what advice would you give yourself? 
I would say um, some version of, of take more risk, uh, less so, you know, in terms of investments, but more so of kind of putting myself out there and, and trying to kind of speed up the learning curve. You know, it seems, seems like such a long time ago, but I, I remember kind of talking to, uh, to CEOs, to other investors and trying to figure out, you know, is it, it, it you know, should I be in this, in this seat? <laughs> and, you know, that's still actually a pretty good question, <laughs> but it's not a question that stops me uh, from trying to go learn and get more information and network and to throw out ideas and to brainstorm and to, uh, you know, talk to entrepreneurs about things that aren't in their pitch decks, like, hey, maybe we should be doing this. Um, and I think there's a there's this entrepreneurial kind of sense uh, that I that I have. Um, uh, this is sense is probably wrong, but there's, a, there's an entrepreneurial spirit that I think is embedded in good VCs because you have to be kind of creative and always thinking about you know what's the ne- next best deal. And I think that's a space where that's like a learning for me over the last year. I would have loved to have had that three years ago, uh, and I know my learning curve would have been steeper. I think that's great advice, and I think it's a great way to to stop here. So we could talk for a lot more time on on Latam Tech, and maybe we'll have to do a round two in the future here. But thanks a lot for for being on the podcast, and I uh, really enjoyed it. Thank you. I did as well. Thanks again for listening to this episode of Crossing Borders with QED's Mike Packer. As always, if you like Crossing Borders, the podcast, please share it with a friend so that more people can learn about what's going on in the Latin American tech ecosystem. Be sure to check out latimlist.com for daily tech news about the region or my book, Crossing Borders, to learn more about doing business in the region. Thanks to Ankel, Sofia, and Josefina for helping produce this podcast. And thanks to you for listening. Have a great rest of your day.